Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Krishna, Hare Krishna, 
Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Harinam Sankirtan Ki Gaurabrimanandi 
So, my name is Jivanath Das, and I'm originally from Philadelphia in America. And that's actually where I joined the movement back in 1975, long time ago. Um, how did I become attracted? Well, I tell you, there are certain aspects of this Krishna consciousness that are very attractive for somebody who likes to enjoy. And being an enjoyer, I found it very attractive to take prasada. Does anybody here not like prasadam? I mean, it is attractive. My first taste of prasadam came at 4.10 a.m. when I went to the temple for Mangal Artik for the first time. I thought, you know they have in America a Sunday feast. They used to call it the Sunday love feast because well, when the movement started in the 1960s, a love feast sounded like something everybody would want to go to. How could you not want to go to a love feast? So we used to call it the Sunday love feast. Now I decided I didn't want to go to that because I thought, well, you know, like everybody goes to that. So I want to see what these Hare Krishnas are really like. So I went to Mangal Artik. Now there's a whole story and I, I, you know what, I like telling my how I became a devotee story. I'm not even sure if it's true anymore. I mean, I start ad-libbing and I'm making stuff up and I'm just thinking, oh, I gotta laugh, I'll, I'll keep saying that. But, so I don't really remember exactly. But I do remember this. The devotee who let me in, he brought me a cup, a white cup with a brown ball in it at quarter after four in the morning. Nobody was there except for me. And he gives me the cup and he says to me, don't touch it. Don't touch what's inside. I want you to take the cup and then pour that ball into your mouth. And I was looking at it like, really? It's all wet. It's like oozing almost. It's dripping all this brown juice out of it. Why would I want to touch that? Why would I want to put that whole thing in my mouth? But I did it. I knocked it back with one big gulp. I was like, whoa, what is this? And he goes, oh, that's a galum jumman. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is how you guys eat at 4 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> You're eating these super sweet brown balls with all this juice dripping out of them? I like it. I like it a lot. And of course, I like the philosophy because that's what actually got me there reading Bhagavad Gita, and, and as I was reading it, I was thinking, this light just kept going on brighter and brighter, like, wow, that makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. So I was reading and reading. I read the Bhagavad Gita in three days, cover to cover, and that's when I went to the temple. I thought, oh, I gotta see what these guys are like. Because let's face it, you're all really weird looking. Oh wait, I look like that now too, oh. <laughs> but Hare Krishnas were weird looking, especially in 1975 in America. You know, we had cool hair back then, and, you know, cool jeans, and we thought we were just so cool. I mean, I thought I was really cool, because I mean, I used to play basketball, I went to university on a scholarship, and you know, I was like, girls, oh come on, come on girls. <laughs> had it all. Had it all going on. Somehow or other, I wasn't happy. Couldn't figure it out. Why aren't I happy? Why don't I want what everybody else seems to want? A nice car, a house, a wife, the kids, all that stuff, nice job, the money. I didn't want it. I didn't care for it. I just wanted to have fun. So I was like really depressed, really unhappy. At 22 years old, you're not supposed to feel like that, especially in America. At that time of my life, I should have been really happy, but I wasn't. So I went to the temple, knocked back my galab jaman. Philosophy's great. The food they eat is, whew, how do you compare that? Four o'clock in the morning, and I'm thinking, if I can get this every day, I'm in. 
So the first Mongol Arctic I went to, now there's a whole, I'm not going to tell the story. I'm not going to do it. I'm giving you the, abri the abridged brief version today. Sorry, because I wanted to actually try to be a little more philosophical. But anyway, my first Mongol Arctic, the devotee who's leading the Mongol Arctic, his name was Vishnu Jana Swami. I didn't know who he was. I just, this guy was like really, really impressive chanter. He had so much charisma. When he chanted, you could almost feel the mantra. He like, Hare Krishna. And I was like, wow, this guy's cool. I like him. And he's got a shaved head and he's wearing the robes, but he's cool. I like him. So the first kirtan I was in, Vishnu Jana Swami, who's famous, right? You've heard of him? Some of you? Look him up on Google, or YouTube, rather. Check out. The guy was like um, empowered. Prabhupada said, anybody who hears his kirtan will become a devotee. And that's really what was happening. He would just chant. He would do Harinam for like eight hours a day. And people would just follow them back to the temple and shave up and become devotees. He was so empowered. So he actually empowered himself to pull me in. Krishna empowered him to pull me in. So I was hooked and I joined the temple. Didn't take me very long, but I will tell you the one story. When I actually moved in the temple, it was probably three days after this Mongol Artik. Because the Mongol Artik, the Prashadam, the philosophy, everything made sense. So three days later, I move in the temple. I come in with one big bag of all my stuff, which they took. I sit down in a chair, and everyone's being so nice to me, because I'm the new guy, Bhakta Joe. And everyone's you know, like, hey, Bhakta Joe, hey Joe, hey, everyone. and I'm sitting there. Then all of a sudden, this is my first day, I hear a buzzing sound on my head. Bzzz, bzzz. Whoa, like, whoa, whoa, what's up? I just got here. I literally just got there and I got shaved up. <laughs> so there's like no changing your mind, no testing the waters. Mm, should I stay or should I go? No, you're a Hare Krishna now. <laughs> no question what I was going to do, but I'm going like this, like, hey, wait, wait, guys, you missed a spot. <laughs> I didn't know about the old Sika thing. I'm thinking, well, why did they leave this bit of hair in the back like that? He must have just forgot. So I told him, you know, you missed a spot. And he's like, no, no, that's called a Sika. We all have one. I was like, okay, it's all right, that's fine. I'm good with this. So I became a devotee. That was in 1975. And it's been not an easy journey. I'll have to be honest with you. For someone who's been around for 48 years, it's, it's been like this. Now, in Sridhar Mayapur, the path is getting a little clearer. Maybe because, well, my body's gotten quite old. I mean, I am 70 years old. And that's kind of what you call old, right? I mean, your grandparents are probably 70s, right? I'm, you're like your grandfather here. I'm the old man, you know? And I should be talking like this, really. It's so nice to see you guys. But Krishna, when you chant his holy names, he gives you some special energy. It's amazing. It's actually amazing what chanting Hare Krishna can do for you. You get empowered. When you surrender to the holy name, you become empowered. And your power comes from that mantra. It's not that you're so special. None of us are really so special. But that mantra is very special. Now, in the last days of Srila Prabhupada's time with us here, one of the things he said a couple days before he left his body, he said, I always wanted to reduce eating, sleeping, mating, and defending to zero. He said, I had mating and defending at zero, and now that I've been sick, 
I have eating and sleeping to zero. Because he stopped eating and he wasn't sleeping. And he said, that was actually the goal of my life, to bring those four things to zero. Now, that's kind of like what we do in our material life. We eat, sleep, mate, and defend. We do that. All human beings eat, sleep, mate, and defend. All the animals, they also have this luxury of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Now, for us to advance in spiritual life, we have to try to reduce those four things. Because those four things are actually for everybody, every living entity. It's not a big deal. You sleep in a nice bed, so what? You're still sleeping. The dog sleeps, you sleep. The cat eats, you eat. Maybe you're eating nicer cooked foods, you're not rummaging for it, you're not having to struggle so much for it, but it's the same. It's actually the same. So devotees, now we are being asked to follow the four regular principles, which is really the basis of our whole movement, our four regular principles and chanting Hare Krishna. Now, could it get any easier? Well, it's not so easy, is it? I mean, it really isn't that easy. It sounds kind of easy. Oh, just follow the regular principles and chant Hare Krishna. Well, you know what Prabhupada once said? If you do this, if you follow these four regular principles and chant Hare Krishna, I guarantee you, you will go back to Godhead. And if you didn't hear it the first time, Srila Prabhupada repeated it. I guarantee it. How simple is this? To get out of this material world, we simply follow four regular principles, which really only brings us to human life, takes us above the animals. It's really not that great of an accomplishment. But for living beings here in Kali Yuga in this time, it's a big deal. People used to come and be attracted to this movement. And we would tell them, we follow these four regular principles. And people like, no, no way. Even when Srila Prabhupada first started this movement in 1966, there were a group of devotees who were following and wanting to take initiation. But they didn't really understand how it all worked. So Prabhupada says, yes, I, I will initiate you. I will take you as my disciple. And they were like, oh, great. You know, it's so casual. Everything's nice. It's all neat. They used to come to the temple, listen to Srila Prabhupada, give a class. When the class was over, they'd go out and they'd have a cigarette, go to the coffee place, have a coffee, have their cigarette, discuss the class. Wasn't that a great class? Yeah, great class. <laughs> they were still doing all kinds of intoxication. So Prabhupada hadn't actually said, okay, we have these things called the regulative principles. So when they actually asked about initiation, Prabhupada told them there are four principles. Actually, he didn't say four. He said there are principles. That's right. He said there are principles, rules that you must follow. Now, back in 1966, the word rules, it's a dirty word because People in 1966 were like just into this whole free love and free drugs and everything's fine, everything's wonderful. No rules. We're not following any rules. We do what we want. The Prabhupada says, no, there are rules. If you want to be my disciple, you must follow rules. And the first rule is no gambling. And they're all like, gamble? Who gambles? I don't even have any money for food. Why would I gamble? Not a problem. I can give that up. I don't even do it. So it's not a big deal to give it up. And the second one was no eating of meat, fish, or eggs. Now, a lot of them were already vegetarian because they were kind of, you know, new age, you know, searchers, and it didn't make sense to killing animals. And so... That was not a big deal. They were fine with the two regular principles. If Prabhupada had just stopped with the two regular principles, 
So many people would have come, right? So many people would have been attracted. We have two regulated principles, everybody. That's it, no gambling and no eating of meat. Okay, I can give up the meat. But Prabhupada said, no, there is another. No intoxication. I'm like, sorry? <laughs> no intoxication? I'm still coming down from the last LSD trip. And you know, I just bought like half a pound of marijuana the other day. Prabhupada says, no intoxication, no marijuana, no LSD, no coffee, no tea, no cigarettes. Half of them left. <laughs> Can't give up my coffee. I drink coffee every day for the last 10 years. I'm not giving up my coffee. I am so hooked on these cigarette things, I can't do it. I love the philosophy, but I can't do it. So half of them left. But the others that stayed, they were like, okay, I'm ready to be a disciple. I will follow these three regular principles. <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, there's a fourth. <laughs> and they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> What's he going to say now? I mean, isn't it like enough to give up the, you know, marijuana and LSD and stuff? Isn't that enough? And Prabhupada says, no illicit sex. And all they heard was no sex. They're like, no sex? Come on, I've been, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know I mean, no sex? Half of them from the other half got up and they left. Can't do that one, sorry. No. Have fun, guys. See you later. We're out of here. Then Prabhupada explained it. He explained what no illicit sex meant. Uh, okay, maybe we can pull that one off. No illicit sex, no gambling, no intoxication, no meat eating. Okay, four regulated principles. And then Prabhupada said, now you got to remember, this is the very, very beginning of the movement. We weren't actually doing what we call rounds with our japa. And actually the japa was really quite amazing to see because they were all homemade. You would go to the arts and crafts stores and buy different colored beads and you would make japa beads. Blue, red, green, yellow, all different colors. And everybody wore them around their neck. Some of them were like plastic and bright fluorescent colors. But everybody had their own individual style of japa beads. So now Prabhupada says, and you must chant Hare Krishna. Well, they've been kind of used to the, the chanting, you know, with the cartels and Prabhupada playing on a madunga. It wasn't really a madunga, it was actually a bongo drums. It just sounded like that. So Prabhupada told them you must chant Hare Krishna. And as you probably know, the Gaudiya Math, where Prabhupada was a member of before coming to America, they chant 64 rounds. 64 rounds. So Prabhupada said you must chant 64 rounds on your japa beads. Whoa! 64 rounds? If I chant 12 minutes around, wow, it's like 12 hours. I mean, what are we going to just sit around and chant all day? We can't do that. We have a life. I have a dog. I have a cat. I have friends. We sit and, oh, we can't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> what am I going to, I, we just can't do it. Swamiji, I'm sorry. We can't chant 64 rounds. And Prabhupada, being so compassionate, he says, okay then, all right, 32 rounds. And again, they're like, that's, only, that's half, if it was, tw that's six hours. Six hours of chanting Hare Krishna on our beads? Oh man, I tell you, you know, I mean, the four regulated principle thing, and then the 32 rounds, oh, it's just too much. So Prabhupada, being so compassionate, said 16 rounds, minimum 16 rounds. Eh, you know, that's not a good Okay, that can be done by lunchtime, that's okay. 
So they accepted Prabhupada's proposals of how to become a spiritual being in this material world by following Krishna Consciousness and the International Society for Krishna Consciousness rules and regulations. So Prabhupada made it very simple for us. Actually, Lord Chaitanya has made this very simple. We don't need to perform great austerities. That's the austerity. That's the austerity that brings us back to Godhead. And that's not really asking too much. We're not asked to sit in the hot sun with a fire around us and just sit there and meditate or be out in the cold and pour ice cold water on ourselves. We don't do all those kind of austerities. We simply follow these regular principles and chant Hare Krishna. So one story about the wonderful mood of Srila Prabhupada and how gracious and compassionate and understanding of who these wonderful, oh they weren't wonderful, these guys that came to us back in 1966. They had a fire sacrifice. This was actually the third fire sacrifice, the third initiation that went on inside ISKCON. This was in San Francisco. New York had already had a couple, now we're in San Francisco. But nobody actually knew about fire sacrifices. So when Prabhupada gave the ingredients for what you need for a fire sacrifice, it didn't make sense to anybody. Okay, wood, that makes sense, because you're going to have a fire. It makes sense. Butter, why would you have butter? When you have to make it into something else, and we need a whole lot of it, it doesn't make sense. Fruit, rice, what are we cooking, they were thinking? What is this fire sacrifice? Because in 1966, if you said the word fire sacrifice to an American, what they're thinking of is these movies we've seen with Tarzan, and they have a guy in a big pot, and that's the fire sacrifice, and he's strapped burning, going, ah! And that's what we thought. It's some kind of really weird ritual thing, you know? It just, we didn't know. Nobody knew. So Prabhupada then starts the fire sacrifice. There are four candidates. Two of them you might have heard of. Shana Sundar, who is kind of famous. He started the temple in London with his wife Malati, who was also there. And so they kind of understood. They heard secondhand that this is some special, special program. So they decided to get dressed up. And you can imagine what dressed up means in 1967. It means he put on a clean shirt. And, well, he had some jeans, but they had holes in them, but at least they were clean. And he had a jacket that he borrowed from a friend, and he put on a tie. The tie didn't match the jacket, the jacket didn't match the shirt, the shirt didn't match the pants. But that was the 60s in America, very colorful. And his wife or girlfriend, Malati, well, she didn't really have anything what you would call respectable to wear. So she wore one of his dress shirts with a pair of pants underneath it. So she was looking kind of, well, not nice, but, you know, for, for what we were trying to accomplish, nice. So the fire sacrifice starts. And they're all watching Srila Prabhupada. He's taking this ladle and he's pouring the ghee on the fire. And the fire is going up up and up and they're just like waiting for instructions and Brahma says when I say swaha, swaha. when Brahma says swaha he says now take your rice and throw it so the four of them are waiting and Prabhupada says swaha. swaha so they all take a handful of rice and they throw it <laughs> right at Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada has gone, no, 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 in the fire. <laughs> oh, in the fire. So they throw it in the fire. And now the fire sacrifice is coming towards the conclusion. And Srila Prabhupada says, now take your banana. And all four of them are thinking, it's been like an hour here, I am starving. <laughs> They start peeling the banana. And Prabhupada goes, no. 
in the fire. <laughs> and they're like, what a waste, you know? This is, this is, I got a good one, look. <laughs> All right. So they throw their banana in the fire. Now, Prabhupada's so tolerant. He actually was, well, kind of hot because it was a really small room. And the fire was blazing. And Prabhupada was sweating. And he still had rice stuck on him from where rice hit him and it stayed. So Prabhupada's sitting there with rice on his forehead, on his head, on the side of his face, down his shirt. Seeing them want to eat the banana, fire sacrifice is finished. They get their names. And now Prabhupada says, in his Bengali accent, which nobody really understood yet, he said, Bodon. Bodon. And the four of them are looking at each other going, well, one of the guys who was about to be initiated was in New York, and now he was in San Francisco. And he kind of thought, well, I, I understand Prabhupada. I, 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 I know what he's saying. So he got down on his hands and knees and started to blow on the fire. And all four of them followed suit. They all got down. They're blowing the fire right towards Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada has to sit back a bit. He goes, obeisances, bow down. And they go, oh, obeisances, bow down. So Prabhupada, so tolerant, teaching us everything. But he was just so tolerant and so loving. And that's Srila Prabhupada's mood. Srila Prabhupada taught everybody how to do everything. Now, in the very beginning of the movement, like I said, nobody really understood fire sacrifices. So there came one in Sweden, and the devotees in Sweden had never heard of a fire sacrifice, never seen a fire sacrifice. So the same thing kind of happened there, sort of. First, the Prabhupada sits down and notices there are no flowers. No flowers anywhere. The room is not decorated. There's no flowers. So Prabhupada says, get some flowers. And he's getting a little agitated. He says, get some flowers. Why are there no flowers? So a couple of the devotees then ran out of the little temple, went to their neighbors, picked all the flowers, and came running back in. There's flowers. Okay. And then Prabhupada said, there is no fruit. There is no fruit. How can we have fire sacrifice? No fruit. So the temple president runs in the kitchen, gets out some apples and oranges and bananas, slices them all up on a nice tray, and brings them out. And Prabhupada says, no, 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 not slice fruit. Whole fruit, like banana, whole banana from fire sacrifice. So the devotee runs back in, comes back out with the bananas. Now Prabhupada is getting agitated because nothing is going right, nothing. And there was a young man sitting there, what we used to call a hippie, long hair, loved the prasadam, liked the kirtan, maybe followed one regular principle, chanted a little bit, you know, a hippie. And every time he would come to the temple, he would hear the devotees say, you know, nah, 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 nah. chant Hare Krishna. Nah, 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 nah. Chant Hare Krishna. Whatever the problem was, whatever the complaint, Chant Hare Krishna. So he sees Prabhupada getting agitated by what's going on. So he turns to Srila Prabhupada and says, Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so Prabhupada bends over and picks up his bead bag and chants Hare Krishna. Good advice, right? But that's how humble, how compassionate the founder acharya of this International Society for Krishna Consciousness is. And because he showed these qualities, he demonstrated them himself. So often in the 1960s, swamis, gurus used to come to America and they would say something and do something else. And that was the norm, that was the norm. They would say, you know, we must control our senses. And then, well, they had three or four girlfriends, were smoking biddies, drinking alcohol, and they're trying to preach, you know, follow me, I'm enlightened. So we were all kind of like, 
you know, I'm sorry, you don't seem to be the real deal. Well, Prabhupada, he was the real deal. He walked the walk, he talked the talk. Whatever he said, he did it himself. Prabhupada chanted Hare Krishna. Prabhupada chanted on his rounds. Prabhupada read his own books. He's encouraging everyone to read the books. Prabhupada read the books. And people used to say, but Prabhupada, you wrote these books. How come you're reading them? And he says, I did not write these books. Krishna wrote these books. So there is so much that we can learn from simply emulating what Srila Prabhupada did. And of course, none of us will be Srila Prabhupada. None of us. I'm so sorry to say, none of us will ever be Srila Prabhupada. But we can follow his example. We can follow his example. One time Prabhupada actually asked his devotees, he said, do you know why I wrote these books? And of course all the answers, well, you know, to give us the absolute truth, to help us understand Krishna, that we had to go back to Godhead, all these kind of answers came out. And Prabhupada said, no, I wrote these books to convince you to chant Hare Krishna. And that was the most important thing that Prabhupada wanted to stress. Everyone should chant Hare Krishna. It's so very important. Now it's advised that we chant 24 hours a day. Is that possible? Not really. Not when you're going to school or you're working or you're, you know, have things to do. But you can meditate on Krishna. You can meditate on his pastimes. You can sing Hare Krishna in your head. It's possible. It's doable. Now there, that Vishnu Janan Swami, when he used to lead kirtan, he used to sing at a, a decent pace to keep it going. And he used to say, if I sing fast, there's no room for Maya to come in. It was a very nice thought process. The faster you chant, there's no room for Maya. So when you're chanting Japa, that's why it's nice to be able to chant a little bit quicker, a little bit quicker. The more you can hear, the more you will chant nicer Japa. Hey Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. I heard everything. It was very nice, but there's no room. So if you chant slow, sometimes the mind is with you on every word you say. And in between those words, the mind's saying, go get a drink, go get a drink, get something to eat. Check your phone. It's been like 10 minutes since you looked at your phone. That's like a long time, isn't it? In 2023, 10 minutes to not look at your phone? I heard a beep. I could have sworn I heard a beep. Somebody messaged me. I got to look. You know one of the keys? I don't bring my phone when I chant Japa. I don't bring my phone. It's really nice. Another, otherwise, you're just like, oh, it's right there. Oh, I know it's right there. Anybody watching? <laughs> You can actually totally divert your consciousness away from Krishna with this wonderful cell phone technology. It can be used, yes. Everything can be used in Krishna's service. But something like the cell phone during japa, during kirtan. I've seen people pull out their cell phone in the middle of an ecstatic kirtan. I'm like, really? You got, I mean, you're, you're like jumping up and down and dancing, and all of a sudden you go, <laughs> like, really? How is that possible? But that's how strong your mind is, trying to work you away. Maya is trying to always pull us away from chanting Hare Krishna. Just like here in Mayapur. Um, I'm very blessed, for one, to live in Sridham Mayapur. Um, look, you can just see, you know, when you say Patita Pavana, and the most fallen, he's the liver of the most fallen. That's how I feel. And I'm always thinking, I really hope he doesn't go, how'd he get here? But somehow or other I'm here. And I'm enjoying being in Sri Dham Mayapur. I'm enjoying the service that I have in Sri Dham Mayapur. And that's really important that you enjoy your service. But Sri Dham Mayapur is so special and I feel very blessed to be here. And every day I thank Srila Prabhupada for bringing me to Sri Dham Mayapur. But I was about to tell you, I have the wonderful opportunity to chant Hare Krishna on Harinam Sankirtan. Now, 
most parts of the world, Harinam Sankirtan means you get in your van, you travel somewhere, you all get out, and you walk around traveling with Kirtan, walking through the streets. Here in Sri Mayapur, everybody comes to us. So we simply have to go to a spot. People know where we are now. We're outside the TOVP office. And the Kirtan is very ecstatic. And it's really interesting, when the Kirtan first starts, what everybody usually does is stare, which is, okay, you know, it's par for the course. Bunch of foreign looking people standing there chanting, chanting Hare Krishna in India, in West Bengal, chanting Hare Krishna, like what are they doing here and we're not doing it? I hope that's what they're thinking. These guys are not from India and they're chanting Hare Krishna. This is our culture. So they all kind of just stare. And of course, cell phone, you gotta have a cell phone. So, you know, this is, this is basically what I see every day on Hari Nam. People staring at me, holding a cell phone. And I always think, okay, you know, you're, you understand you should chant Hare Krishna. And my job is always to get them to chant Hare Krishna, somehow or other. I have to think, what, what, what should I do? And Krishna will usually answer that for me. He'll usually say, okay, say this, do this, do this, do this, whatever it takes, get them to chant Hare Krishna. Somebody wants to ask Srila Prabhupada, how can we improve this movement by bringing people to it? And Prabhupada says, you simply encourage them to chant Hare Krishna. That's your job. Your job is to encourage them to chant Hare Krishna. Engage them to chant Hare Krishna. And the rest is up to Krishna. Krishna will then connect with them. And depending on how close they are to becoming devotees, they might become devotee. This life, later this life, next life. But you've done your job. You've given them the mantra. So as devotees now in this International Society for Krishna Consciousness, you've all sort of taken a step. You're sitting here in Sri Mayapur. You're having Krishna Kata. You're having Kirtan. I was <clears throat> standing on the steps at the end of the Kirtan tonight, Guru Puja, after Guru Puja. And I was watching and I was thinking, you guys are just so fired up. It's so blissful, isn't it, to be able to chant with people who like chanting like you like chanting, it raises the whole energy level way up there. I mean, just like the kirtan, when I walked in, I mean, I was just in ecstasy hearing you singing. Hearing you singing, you're playing. Everything sounded so nice. Where else can you get this? Where else? I've been doing this for 48 years, and I still feel that every kirtan is like the best kirtan. <clears throat> I come home from Harinam, and we have great kirtans here in Mayapur. And I'm really hoping some of you come to our Harinam Sankirtan. But every time I come home, I always say to my wife, that was the best kirtan. And she says, you say that every night. I said, yeah, because it was the best kirtan. Every kirtan is the best kirtan. If we just enjoy the fact that we've been given a privilege, and that privilege is you know about Hare Krishna. You know about ISKCON. That's a privilege. And you guys are blessed to have that privilege, to be able to chant Hare Krishna, to put some meaning to your life, to have a goal. The goal? Go back to Godhead. Get out of this material body. Get out of this whole material world and go back to Godhead. And you can do it. How do you do it? Well, Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna, follow the four regular principles, and you will go back to Godhead, I guarantee it. So Prabhupada has guaranteed it. And since I am trying to repeat what Prabhupada says, I'll guarantee it. I guarantee it. I actually believe it. I thoroughly believe it. I believe that by chanting Hare Krishna, <clears throat> I will go back to Godhead. I really believe that. I believe that Srila Prabhupada will come for me. At the time of death, Srila Prabhupada will come for me. I'll tell you a story. There was a devotee in France. He was a sannyasi. He did a lot of service. He was one of the original devotees in France. 
but he left the movement. And not only did he leave the movement, which, which happens, Prabhupada says, don't be surprised who stays. No, don't be surprised who goes, be surprised who stays. So this devotee left. And he didn't just leave to break the regulative principles, which is what most people do. He left and became a Satan worshiper. He was like the leading Satan worshiper in France, in Europe. He used to wear these outfits that were so demoniac. There are pictures of him. On, you can Google him. He's got like horns and he's just so out there. It was so uh, sad to see a devout follower in this movement turn into a Satan worshiper. But any t anyway, he was contracted a disease, was getting ready to leave his body. And his girlfriend, who knew nothing, nothing of Hare Krishna's, didn't even know that he was a devotee, was at his bedside. And right before he left his body, he sat up and went, Oh, Srila Prabhupada, you've come. And then left his body. And she had no idea who this Srila Prabhupada was. So she was asking the nurses and doctors. He said, the Srila Prabhupada, you've come. Who is this? And one of them knew that that was from the Hare Krishna temple. So they went, she went there and she told the devotees that story. Now this is somebody who became a Satan worshiper and Prabhupada came for him because he did such nice service. He chanted very wonderfully from his heart. He made devotees. So Prabhupada didn't forget, Krishna doesn't forget. So this gathering here today, all that you've done in these days that you've been here and days that you're going to be here and days when you go back to where you're from, you're getting so much credit, so much spiritual benefit for it. Nobody can take that away from you. If you were to walk out of here right now and say, okay, that's it, I want nothing to do with this Krishna consciousness. You've already made a lot of advancement. That if you don't finish it this lifetime, you'll come back again and finish it next lifetime. So we've made so much spiritual credit. And that's why every time you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. You're making advancement. Just imagine yourself on a ladder, and right there you just took one rung. You went up one rung on the ladder, just by that one mantra. That one mantra, you made some advancement that can never be taken away from you. Now, I'm actually thinking a lot of you, you've received books elsewhere, Europe, Australia, America, and you left your body. You didn't come to Krishna consciousness, but you got the boon. You got the great blessing of being born in India. And now you're all going to finish it in this lifetime. And I'm going to take some credit. Because I distributed a lot of Srila Prabhupada's books in the 70s. I might have given you a book. Or you. Or you. And you took it home. You looked at it. You put it down. And that was it. But you made some advancement. And Krishna says, ah, look. He did take that book. Now you left your body and you took birth in India. What am I doing in India? I don't want to be in India. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. This is the place. This is the best place in the whole world. And you took birth here. And I'm thinking I gave you a book. I gave you a book. I gave you a book. Your last life I'm talking about. I gave you all books. I'm taking credit for everybody here. For all we know, I could be right. Probably not, but hey. Works for me. So you're blessed. You should feel blessed. And you should feel very happy. And you should feel very proud to be here. And you should also be extremely happy to be able to say, thank you, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you to all the devotees who came before me. Thank you for all the devotees in this room. And don't ever stop chanting Hare Krishna. That will save you from this birth, death, old age, and disease. And you don't want that. You don't want that. Especially 
for somebody like myself. Right now, I'm 70 years old. I can see the finish line. It's like the race, and you can see the finish line. It's getting closer. You guys, the race is just starting. And you're thinking, yeah, you know, I'm still good here. You know, I can dance in kirtan. I can't even dance in kirtan anymore. I do a few moves and I go, oh, okay, <clears throat> that kind of hurt. Oh, that hurt. All right, that hurt. Why is everything moving when I'm jumping? It used to be all, oh, oh. But that's what happens. Krishna helps us by giving us this old age. I probably would have never, you know, gotten more serious. But Krishna says, now I'm giving you this old body you can't enjoy. You can't even think you can enjoy. You guys can maybe still think, oh, I can enjoy. I'm 25 years old. I'm going great. I'm just about to start this. I'm doing this. Everything's going great. Look at me. 70 years old. I can't enjoy anything anymore. I can't eat that. I'm sorry. Stomach problems. Okay, okay. Kirtan. <laughs> That's the best I can do. I'm sorry. All the fun things in life. I'm not going to go into the, you know, well, sex and all. Anyway, you don't get that. It goes away. Krishna takes it away. So give it up before he takes it away and make more advancement. Now, you guys have all made this commitment. You're here. And I think that's a big deal. And I'm really impressed by your enthusiasm. And I'm going to say one thing. Don't lose it. Right? The ecstasy that you guys are feeling by chanting Hare Krishna if you keep this mood, it only gets better. It only gets better. Trust me, it really does. And people used to come up to us when we would do Harinam on the street. And they would see us and, and they used to comment, you guys all have such bright faces. Yeah, we're 22, 23 years old, we have bright faces, we're enjoying chanting Hare Krishna. But then they would say, what drugs are you guys doing? because it just wasn't natural in the material world. In 1966, 76, 86, 96, 2006, 2016 is not natural unless you're chanting Hare Krishna to be bright-faced, to be enthusiastic about the goal of life, going back to Godhead. Nobody else is feeling that but you guys here. So feel privileged and very blessed to have come in contact with devotees to choose to be around devotees. That's a big deal. I'm sure there's other things you could be doing back home that has nothing to do with Krishna, but you're here. You're in Sri Mayapur Dham, the birthplace of Kirtan, and I'm really thinking that a lot of you are gonna to wanna to come to the Harinam. Am I correct? Are they allowed to come? Prabhu says you're allowed to come. He's given his permission, his blessings, and that means that he will come as well. <laughs> right? You got to hold him to... Will you come as well, Prabhu? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. All right. So you will all come to Harinam. I don't care how many show up. You can all show up. It'll be ecstatic. I guarantee it will be ecstatic. No matter when you come, it will be ecstatic. So I want to thank you all for allowing me to sit and make some noise about Krishna consciousness. Hopefully you're encouraged to chant Hare Krishna forever and ever. Like one time, they're on a morning walk in Vrindavan, and there's a lot of flies. And the flies are buzzing all around, and everyone's getting really agitated by the flies. So finally one devotee said, Srila Prabhupada, are there flies in this spiritual world? And I'm like, this sounds like a, you know, a joke, right? If I, pfft, come on, what a stupid thing to say. And Prabhupada said, yes, they are. Yes, but they are not annoying, and they chant Hare Krishna. So, okay, we can deal with the flies in the spiritual world. But there are so many obstacles on our path, but if we stay strong by chanting Hare Krishna, by staying in the association of devotees, and by taking Krishna prasadam, your journey back to home is guaranteed. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Does anybody want to ask a question or comment? Come sit up here and give class. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you.
thank you so much for this wonderful session. Uh, as you said something about Srila Prabhupada, uh, the, the quality which you mentioned about him was he was so tolerant. Mm. So can you can you uh, ex can you express some more qualities about him and give us the idea of what you uh, what is the first picture that comes to your mind when you think of Srila Prabhupada? Ooh, good question. I like that one. It just so happens that as you get older, your memory, it does fade. But I have a memory that doesn't fade. And that was the first time I actually saw Srila Prabhupada. And I'll tell you the story. I was chanting Japa prior to the Rath Yatra in New York City in 1976, at which time I would become initiated by Srila Prabhupada. And this Japa was being chanted about 9.20 at night outside the New York temple. There was only two or three devotees out there at the time. And a car pulled up. And out came Srila Prabhupada. Now, in 1976, usually Srila Prabhupada was surrounded by sannyasis, GBCs, temple presidents. I was a mere book distributor. Not a big deal. So this was Srila Prabhupada getting out of the car. The devotee opened the door and Srila Prabhupada started walking towards the temple by himself. And it just so happened I was right on the path and I saw Srila Prabhupada get out of the car. And you probably heard or seen uh, devotees tell you or the memories that Prabhupada was glowing. He was glowing. There was night, there wasn't much light, but Prabhupada was like lit up. And it was, it was just like this amazing, and I actually felt he has come from the spiritual world. He's not like anybody else I've ever seen before. And not only that, I'm six foot two, Prabhupada was like five foot four. He was really little. And that blew my mind, because being an American, somehow we always put, you know, Rah, big guys are always, you know, the quarterback of the football team is a big guy. The heroes in the sports and the movies are all like big guys. And here's this little bodied, pure devotee who's so powerful. And that was Srila Prabhupada. So I was kind of shocked. And then I came to my senses after thinking all these thoughts and I'm thinking, pure devotee, I, I, I'm meeting somebody from being with Krishna now to being with me. And as he was walking past me, I paid my obeisances, and I got up to my knees, and I was almost at eye level with Srila Prabhupada. And he looked in my eyes, and you've probably heard this before, but when he looked in his eyes, it wasn't like me looking at you, at you. It was like, way deep. And it scares you, because generally speaking, we want people to see what we want them to see. We don't want people to go, Oh, you used to do that, and your last priority were this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. These are all the things we don't want anybody to see. But Prabhupada, he could look right inside, and he could see, you're a nonsense. You're still doing all kinds of silly things and having silly thoughts. But Prabhupada looked at him, and he shook his head, did the pranam thing, and I was like, oh my gosh. He knows who I am, and he's still smiling at me. He's still saying, like, it's okay. It's okay, don't worry, you're, you're doing the right thing. I was about to be initiated two days later, so it just made me feel so warm inside that somebody still loved me, still cared for me, but yet knew who I was. And I didn't have to pretend to be anything. I could just be myself, and Prabhupada says, it's okay. Whatever qualities you have, they're not so good, we'll turn them into good. And whatever things you do that are good, we're going to make them better. And that's how Prabhupada treated all his disciples. Some of the disciples from the early days of this movement were not the most together people. They dropped out of school. One devotee who did so much service didn't even finish grade school. He stopped in grade seven. He started temples, printed books. He did so much stuff. But Prabhupada would see one thing in them, two things, sincerity, and enthusiasm. You can go a long way with a little bit of enthusiasm. I'm still here. I'm not the 
most scholarly devotee. I probably could tell you my shlokas on my hand and one two. But I've always been enthusiastic to chant Hare Krishna. I've always been enthusiastic to follow what Prabhupada's instructions were. And that is what has kept me connected to Krishna consciousness. So if you actually firmly believe in this Krishna consciousness movement, firmly believe that chanting Hare Krishna will take you back to Godhead, and you enthusiastically follow these principles and stay with them, association devotees, take prasadam, you're going back to Godhead. But that's the one vision that it's so clear. Everything else, I, you know, I couldn't tell you any, too many other stories. I know a couple more stories. But if you come back next year, I'll tell them. You have to come back next year, though. But yeah, that's the one vision that's uh, it's carried me for 48 years. Is seeing Srila Prabhupada. Is, you know, I only had a couple other interactions with him. But uh, that one was the first and the, the most special for me. That is a vision I'll never forget. You know, to actually see Srila Prabhupada. And you know, you can hear and you can read and you get that connection with, with Prabhupada. There's no doubt. But I'll be honest, seeing Srila Prabhupada is pretty special. <laughs> I gotta be honest. <laughs> but thanks you for the question. That was good. Somebody else? Behind you, yeah. You have been practicing the Krishna consciousness for 8 years. Uh-huh. So, did you find any difference or did you realize any difficulties as compared to Western and Indian culture? Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding? Oh, I mean, the Western culture is just so degraded. It's so degraded. I went, I have, I've been living in Mayapur for six years, but prior to that, I was in Australia, Canada, America. And I chose, once I finished my um, business life, I decided I'm going to go live in Mayapur. I've always had an attachment to Lord Chaitanya. Did you all see him? It's Lord Chaitanya on my arm. So I wouldn't forget. I put him on my arm. Anyway, if you can't see him, too bad. But I always thought that I'll finish this journey by coming to Sri Mayapur. And Prabhupada often called his Western devotees dancing white elephants. And I actually feel like that is a really good term to describe me, is a dancing white elephant. Because now I actually feel like an elephant when I dance. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> and I used to be like, so, you know, oh, anyway. But what was the question? <laughs> oh, the cultures. Are you kidding? That's what I was going to say. The West is so degraded. It's so easy to be in Maya because they really sell the sense gratification product. And they sell it well. They really do. There's so much sense gratification. In America, if you go into a supermarket, there's supermarkets, they, they have all the psychology of where to put what, where, and all of that. And there's not only like a choice of one of three things, it's one of 25 things. And anything you can think of, you can buy. I mean, so you can just have your senses go crazy. You know, and, and just everything about it is, is so set up to stay in the material world. And you can enjoy. It's all temporary, but you can enjoy there, especially in America and Canada and Australia, the countries I lived in. You know, Australia, think about it. Great beaches, you know, girls walking around in bikinis, nice food, everybody's got like a no worries mate. You know, it's all, it's all good, no problem. So the whole mentality in the Western world is to stay in the material world. But, as we can see, there is a, a swell of people getting back to their roots of Krishna consciousness, the Vedic culture. I mean, look at you guys. Like in the West, they say, oh, look, Krishna consciousness, is, it's fading, it's dying. And I go, come on, look around. Look at these guys. 
I was remarking when I was watching you guys in Guru Puja, I was standing over in what they call the VIP section, only because I can't dance anymore. But I was watching you guys dancing in Guru Puja, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, look at you guys. You're so bright-faced. You haven't done a lot of you know, bad things in your life yet. You're still fresh, you're still new, and you're taken to Krishna consciousness. And now you're all going to be running this movement in a few years. And I feel pretty confident that when I go and I leave, that the movement's in good hands. You guys are awesome. You're awesome. I can just feel the spiritual energy coming from you all. You know, so it's, you know, I wish I was in that 25-year-old body. I would, have had a hoot I would have had so much fun dancing with you guys today. Because we used to dance, crazy dance. So much energy. So much, let's let it out. We all just dance, 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 dance. And when the kirtan was over, you're like, woo, yeah, wow. You know, it was just so much fun to be a devotee. And it still is, isn't it? Isn't it fun to be a devotee? You're not going to do it, right? You're not going to do this if it's not fun, right? If it's just pain and suffering, you're going to be like, oh, I can't do this. But because it's like, yes, I can do this. This is ecstatic. Want some prashadam? Yes! Yes! You want kirtan? Yes! Yes! You want to hang out with a bunch of great guys? Yes! It's all here. It's all here in Krishna consciousness. There's nothing better. Trust me. Having been on this planet in this body for 70 years, I can tell you, there's nothing better. There is nothing better than being a devotee. Especially now especially in India, and especially hanging around devotees like yourselves. You guys are awesome. Prabhu, uh, I wanted to ask uh, how difficult it was for you to transition from your you know, the life before Krishna consciousness and once you got into Krishna consciousness, like how, what are the challenges you faced while you were transitioning? Like you did mention about the four regulator principles and right. the reactions around it. But personally, personally? Yeah. yeah, personally. Well, like I told you in the beginning of the story, I was already, I'd had it with material life. <clears throat> I knew I didn't fit in, and I was just bewildered. What am I supposed to do? I don't want to be a lawyer, an engineer, a doctor. I don't want to do any of those things. I just wanted to party and have fun, you know, play sports. That's what I wanted to do. But I wasn't good enough to make a living out of it, so it was like I was frustrated. So becoming a devotee, I felt like I was joining this Krishna conscious team or I was a soldier in Prabhupada's army. These are all the kind of feelings I had. And again, I was surrounded by a bunch of guys my age and we were all like, you know, every kirtan was just like it's so ecstatic. And the Vrashadam was wonderful. I didn't mind sleeping on the floor. I didn't mind sleeping in a room full of 15 other guys. It, that stuff was just like, I don't care. I can actually see that this Krishna consciousness is, is, is making me happy. I was really happy. And now, the key to that is, yes, when you first become a devotee, there's so much ecstasy. Like, you guys are having a great time. Great time being a new devotee in Krishna consciousness. How are you going to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Are you still going to be having a great time? And that's up to you. If you stay enthusiastic about all the things that you enjoy right now in Krishna consciousness, they're only going to get better. Like, I, I just, I love kirtan. I love kirtan. I have really a hard time walking past a kirtan and not stopping and being a part of it. Because it just, it pulls me in. Because I've surrendered. This is me. This is what I like. I love kirtan. It just, it makes me feel so connected to Krishna. That there's nothing else matters. All my physical ailments go away. All my mental problems. Everything goes away when you just immerse yourself in the holy name. It's a special, special gift that Lord Chaitanya has given us in this age. It's just to let loose. So I didn't really find the problems. I didn't find the problems until later in Krishna consciousness. When you think, oh, you know, I want to get married, and then you have kids, and then you have a business, and things are good. And then you start stressing about all those things. But to be really honest, when I did those things, I always said to myself, you will go back, you will be a full-time devotee, like you were when you joined, once 
my children are all in their 40s and late 30s and stuff like that, and they're all doing their own thing. And now I'm just a devotee again. So it's going to come full circle for me. And Krishna has fulfilled my desires of letting me come to Mayapur, letting me be involved with Kirtan, letting me be involved with wonderful devotees. Do you know, like this is very special for me to sit here. I can almost imagine myself sitting there like 40 some years ago and listening going, okay, yeah, cool. You know, I didn't know any 70 year old devotees besides Prabhupada. <laughs> we were all 20s. The oldest guy was like 30 and he was old. But you guys are all like the same age, you got the same energy. You know, it's just ecstatic. And you should all be helping each other, bringing each other along. And then you won't have problems. And don't be afraid to open up. That's a really important thing. Really important. When I was about eight years in the movement, I ended up in Australia. And I was one of the older devotees. And the younger devotees used to always come to me with problems. And I used to, like, counsel back then. And I, I really felt that if you didn't open up to somebody else, to a senior, or even just to somebody, then the problem becomes bigger than it really is. But you will have problems. It's not like this is just a you know, smooth slide right back to Godhead. There's, there's, Maya is not going to give up on her. She's going to keep fighting for you to go back to the material world. But you have to be stronger. And that's why the sadhu sangha, this, this connection with other devotees is very important. And you have wonderful seniors here who you know, are guiding you and offering you good advice and counseling and things like that. So yeah, utilize that and then problems will become minimized. But I recommend kirtan. I really do. Whenever I feel a little bit stressed out, I go to Harinam and I just forget about it. Not a problem. No more problems. Kirtan just takes them right away. And that's what it's supposed to do. Because you're connecting. The holy name and Krishna, non-different. So you're connecting. It's special. You get to do that. You get to connect with God. I mean, that's wow. Right? Unbelievable. There you go. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Uh, at what age you can make uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in your arm? Oh, <laughs> um, that was about 10 years ago. Ten, so 60 years old. It was right before I came to Mayapur. And um, I actually had a plan. Uh, my plan was to come to Mayapur and wear a chutter that exposed my arm. And people would see, big white guy, Mahaprabhu on your arm, let me take a picture. And I'd say, okay, you can take a picture, but you have to take a Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and that was my plan. And I actually messaged the temple and said, can I do that? And they said, yeah, we'll give you a booth, like a picture booth. Come take a picture with the big white guy with the tattoo on his arm. And I thought, okay. But I actually did it to remind me that I wanted to be in Mayapur, I want to stay connected with Kirtan, and I also want to dis help distribute Prabhupada's books, because that's something I used to do. So, but yeah, about 10 years ago, 2000, yeah, 2013. Okay, we're good. Thank you.